Hello, and welcome to tonight's bowl session on Volpone. Thank you all for joining us both here on the webinar and on YouTube. Uh, as you all know, there we just did a reading of this this past Monday that is available until tomorrow at 7 o'clock, at which point it disappears for forever. So uh, if you or any of your friends have not watched it yet, please do watch it before 7 p.m. tomorrow. My name is Nathan Winkelstein. I'm the Associate Artistic Director at Red Bull Theatre and the moderator for tonight's discussion. I am beaming into you from Harlem, New York, in the ancestral lands of the Lenape people. And I am going to very quickly, before I introduce our panelists, I'm going to very quickly talk us through the tech of how to ask questions here on the webinar in case any of you haven't dealt with that before. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that you have a Q&A option. That is, uh, not surprisingly, uh, your primary option for this question and answer session. You can type questions into that. I will see them. I will present them to the panelists or as many of them as I can. You will not see other people's questions. So both do not think you are only speaking into a void, but also do not think that I have a plethora of questions. I'm always very excited to have them. So please do ask if you've got anything. Um, if for any reason you want to ask the question with your own voice, please write the question in the Q&A and also click the raise hand function. If I see a question in the Q&A, I will check to see if that person's hand is raised. If so, I will ask you to unmute and then you can ask the question in your own voice. Uh, that does not make it any more or less likely that you will be asked to have your question. It's just if you want to engage yourself verbally. Enough of that. Let's introduce our wonderful panelists for tonight. You got a sneak preview of her just a moment ago, so I'll introduce her first. Our scholar for tonight's discussion is the wonderful Jean Howard. Uh, she is an American professor in English studies and a Shakespeare expert. She is the George Delacourt Professor in the Humanities at Columbia University. Um, and Jean, you can turn your video on now. Um, hi, Jean. <laughs> um, and... Then my the next guest is the director of our presentation of Volpone, who you all probably know better as the artistic director of Red Bull Theater, my boss. Um, so I didn't think of a good introduction because I'm not protective of my job status. The wonderful Jesse Berger. And then finally, representing the talent, uh, we have the, um, I'm not supposed to say she's extraordinary or anything because it speaks for herself. So she played Lady Politic would be in Volpone. The actor Mary Testa. <laughs> um, so you all can unmute and um, let us get this conversation started because it always takes a, a minute or two for our uh, our guests to start asking questions. Jean, um, all of our guests have seen Mary Testa in action and have seen the work of Jesse. You are our our new special guest for this one. So I'd love to start with you. Um, I know that you're a huge scholar of the Johnson works and were, uh, and that you noted that there were some changes made in this one by uh, both our wonderful director and by the wonderful playwright, Jeffrey Hatcher. I was wondering how you found those changes and how you found them working and whether they were um, loyal to the Johnsonian spirit, et cetera. I think they were very loyal to the Johnson that I love best, which is the really comic Johnson. And, uh, you know, I loved what was done to this text. Um, it, this version removed some of the obscure language. It updated some of the language. It did away with a lot of the topical illusions that are very hard to follow now. And it removed a couple of minor characters. And I thought all of those changes made it move faster and it made it easier for the audience to appreciate the underlying comedy. So coming at the tail end of COVID, I thought this was a fabulous Johnson uh, version, loved it. Um, Jesse did ask me while we're all warming up our questions if I'd say just a little bit about this play and I'm happy to I won't talk for more than about five minutes but I will say a few things this was a play uh, at the beginning of what I call Johnson's great period about 1607 um, Shakespeare was writing King Lear and Macbeth and Antony and Cleopatra at about the same time it was the early years of King James's reign and it's an example of what we call city comedy, a comedy set in one of the great urban cities of Europe. Um, most city comedies are set in London. 
And this one is unusual and that it's set in Venice. And Venice was, um, everybody knew something about Venice in the early modern period. It was a great city of trade. Goods came across the Mediterranean from the Silk Road. Then they were dispersed up into Europe. Many different kinds of people from Asia and North Africa came through Venice. It protected strangers and foreigners by its laws. And you'll notice that this play ends in a courtroom. Um, it was a republic. Uh, there were many unusual features of it. And lots of the guidebooks about Venice talk about the courtesans of Venice. And those weren't just women of easy virtue, but women with enormous um, cultural talents. They could sing, dance, converse. And um, Sir Lady uh, Politic would be Mm, seems to be very interested in like being uh, perhaps in that crowd herself. So I'm interested in talking to Mary about that later. Um, but yes, uh, Venice was known among other things for its courtesans. What Johnson did was make this the city of avarice. And from the opening lines of this play, when Volponi comes out and praises his gold and grabs those coins out of the chest, this is, we know, a play about greed and everybody wants uh, money, they want money. And what will they not do to get it? They'll prostitute their wives, they'll disinherit their sons, they'll do anything. And to underscore how bad this is, Johnson makes the, gives them all the names of beasts because they dehumanize themselves. So while well, pony means fox and mosca means fly and then well, um, Corvino and Corbaggio, these are the names of birds of prey, vultures and crows and things like that. So he's using the beast fable to indicate what this kind of avarice um, does to people. Part of the art of this text is that it's all done in one day. It's the unities. You know, everything happens in Venice, one place in one 24 hour period. And the speed of the play is a result of that. And as one scam unfolds, uh, another one interrupts it and Hamish as um, Mosca began to sweat wonderfully as the play went on because he had to move so fast. And that's part of the fun of this play. And in the next big comedy he wrote, The Alchemist, Johnson just speeded everything up twice as fast. He was learning how to do these wonderful farce plots based on the unities where just one damn thing happens after another. And I love the way that this was so speedy and things like just toppled on top of one another. Um, one final thing I'll say about this play, just to get us rolling, is that it's very theatrical. That is, theatricality is built into the heart of the play. Everybody does their scam by dressing up as somebody or using props, putting on a play. And every time that Volponi pretends to be sick, he puts on his black cap. Andre did that repeatedly and he gets his blanket or his shawl around him and he's pretending to be sick. But when he's Skoto the monobank, you know, wooing Celia, he's limber and spry and has his vial of potions and so forth. And he completely transforms himself. And that is the art that underpins the scam always. And of course, Johnson is a dramatist and his stock in trade is using devices, theatrical devices to make his play. So he's kind of winking at himself. The last thing, I did say it, the former comment was the last one, but I didn't mean it. The real last comment is that this is the grimmest of Johnson's comedies. And it has a really weird ending for a comedy because all these scammers in most of Johnson's other plays, they all get off in the end. Um, you know, they're forgiven. Um, sometimes they just run away and they're not really forgiven, but in The Alchemist, a couple of them just go out over the back gate and are gone. But in this play, there's this court of law at the end and they're very grim punishments. Uh, this production went over that pretty fast because it was more comic. But nonetheless, you know, while Pony having pretended to be sick, both loses his fortune and has to go to a hospital for the incurables with the lepers and so forth. And he's going to spend his later days not living in luxury, but living in this hospital. 
and uh, Mosca's going to the galleys, you know, and be whipped, and others lose their fortunes and are paraded through the streets of Venice or the canals of Venice as cuckolds. So this is an unusual comedy. Some people haven't even wanted to call it just a comedy. They wanted to call it a tragic comedy. Um, and Johnson got softer, funnier. I don't know what word we want to say, but his other comedies don't end in quite this grim fashion. And what I liked about this is you made Volpone more like his other comedies, uh, which is the Johnson that I particularly like, because I like to laugh when I'm in the theater at a comedy. So that's all I have to say to, say to get us rolling. Thank you, Jean. Um, and and let's, it feels like that um, sort of wants a directorial response um, a little bit about uh, Jesse. Obviously, you've you've directed this play um, in in a full production, but that was many many years ago, um, and you were coming back and having to reimagine it in a different world and in a different format. Um, and what was it that uh, got you excited? Other than the fact that it's a great Johnson play, what was it that got you excited about coming back around to this play again for this presentation? Um, that's yeah, it's so much a great question and so many interesting things to talk to. About this play. I mean, what, what got me excited about it? Um, well, I wasn't that excited about it. I thought, oh, at first I thought, uh, I guess we could go back to Volpone. It's been about a decade, uh, but I, I'm a little leery of going back to things. I think, oh, we did it, it was successful. Well, let's just let it be. I don't want to do it and fail. <laughs> you know, we made it. But, and Johnson is prickly, Johnson is hard. So I remembered the effort of the 2012 production that we did. And it was a wonderful cast and it was a great experience and it was tied up with Hurricane Sandy. Like it was, it was a difficult, it was a difficult process. So I, so at first revisiting it seemed like, oh, I don't know if I want to go there again. Uh, but I, but I also knew that it was a great comedy and it was a great way to finish our season online. And, and it was almost a year to the day, Mary, I don't know if you re realize this, almost a year to the day that we did an online reading of the government inspector yes. last yes. year, which was one of our first kind of forays into the online universe of readings and stuff. And that was so much fun. Um, and so I thought it would be a really nice bookend to that experience for all of our online audiences as well as ourselves doing it. And um, for those of you who have been following Red Bull, uh, and I know many of you listening are, we were planning a production of Benjamin the Alchemist for the spring of 2020, and then the fall of 2020, and then the spring of 2021. And now sometime later, sometime sooner than, than uh, uh, sooner than later, we hope. We're, but it's coming this season live. So I wanted to do Ben Johnson. I wanted to make sure he was part of our spring season online. Uh, and once I started working on it, I'm sorry, this is a long-winded answer, but once I started working on it, I thought, oh, this is so much fun. Of course, we're going to get a great cast of wonderful characters and then play it online. And um, But there were aspects of the text that I thought, oh, I don't know how to fix this. And I had done, and Jean was the scholar on uh, and wrote wonderful program notes and was with us on that and I wasn't sure how to solve some of the problems that I thought, oh, this is a little, th these jokes are not as, they're not so funny and they're a little tasteless now. And, and I'm not even sure why I thought it was okay in 2012, but it's definitely not okay now. And so I called on Jeffrey Hatcher, who's a wonderful playwright and who also did the version of Government Inspector that we did a great success. And we also had commissioned to do the version of The Alchemist that's coming uh, to theaters near you in New York City soon, live. Um, and so I called Jeff and I said, would you please help us a little bit with The Alchemist? Uh, maybe fix a song or two. Some of those lyrics are just not funny and they're a little insulting. And of course, Jeff, um, well, not of course, we are lucky that Jeff is a very um, facile and uh, talented and brilliant and funny and fast writer. And he, once he got into it, uh, he, he couldn't stop himself. And he would say, well, I took a look at that scene too. What if we did a little bit here for Lady Politic? And, uh, and I would say, yes, please. And what about, and what about this? What, and I was, I always thought it was weird. Lady Politic would be, for instance, that doesn't appear in the last scene of Pony in the original. And it was always, it always bothered me. I thought, well, I, but I'm not a writer. I'm just, in, I'm really good at editing these plays. I'm not so, I'm not a writer. So I said, is there any way Lady Politic could reappear at the end of the play? What would that be like? And, you know, the next day I had a scene. So we were really lucky that we had Jeff, who is a kind of Johnsonian spirit, I think, to work with on, work with us on this. And bringing it forward so that aspect of it was a lot of fun um and there's so many things I, I wanted to talk about that i wanted to just follow up on one thing you said gene about the 
so interesting this thing about the bitter ending and the, the kind of you know some of the, a lot of the scholarship and i remember reading it back in when i was working on the play in 2010 and 11 and 12 and again now about how it's a savage farce and it has such a bitter ending and it's true those punishments are bitter but the more i worked on it and of course we were going at it from a comic standpoint of wanting it to be a fun-filled event as much as possible but i i wonder even other than the fact that those punishments are real punishments I don't know if it's so bitter. I, I don't. I think maybe the audience would have thought that was funny anyway. Uh, you know, and maybe it is. I wonder about where that scholarship begins, where that sense of the play as being kind of bitter and dark um, comes from. Because uh, is it contemporary to Johnson that we hear about that, or is it? I'm suspecting. I'm theorizing. It's 20th century scholarship looking back and saying, you know, in a kind of post World War II way, saying what a dark what a dark comedy this is, when in fact it may not have been. Well, your hunch is right that the scholarship is 20th century, and Johnson has always been, in contrast to Shakespeare, written as the moralist. Mm -hmm. And people argued that his morality was quite harsh, and he was quite intolerant of foibles, and especially uh, avarice and greed, so, so forth. And yes, that is a 20th century critical construction. I, of course, we don't know what audiences thought in the period. It's certainly not a Shakespearean ending, nor is it an ending really like the alchemist or Barlamy Fair. I mean, terrible things happen in Barlamy Fair. And then in the end, the, sort of the sheriff in town, Mr. Overdue says, oh, come to my house for dinner, everybody. And, you know, everybody's invited, nobody's punished for anything in particular. And it does seem that Johnson's sense of a comic ending evolved. So I think there's plenty of comedy in Volpone. I thought you brought it out and all the changes, contemporary editions, they all were great. Um, I didn't think you completely wiped away the force of some of those last lines. They're just, they're just there. No, she says, let mischiefs uh, be even, or something until they bleed. I mean, it, you're right. There, I mean, there, there's definitely a, a mean-spiritedness in that, or a um, there's a jaggedness to Johnson. I think I said today, I, I read a quote to the actors that I wanted to share, and, and, and I'm sure Nathan has a great question for Mary, but, <laughs> but there, that I really like, uh, Ann Barton, who is a scholar, I'm sure you know, Jean, uh, mm -hmm. said something about Volpone that I read to the actors on the first day of rehearsals, which I'll just read. She said, Johnson's characters are more true to life than Shakespeare's because they had less capacity for insight into themselves. And I think that's really true. And that that's what makes, in a way, makes it more fun. I think comically, maybe Mary, maybe you could respond to that. I mean, well, I, I you know, I love, I realize that I love playing a character that's deluded. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's just, it's <laughs> wonderful because you can be anything and have any attitude because you are completely unaware of the reality of what's going on. So, you know, uh, Anna was that way in Government Inspector and and so was is Lady, you know, Lady Woodby. Um, so yeah, um, that makes perfect sense. You know, it totally makes perfect sense. Kind of the opposite of it, makes, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. May I may I ask oh. sorry, sorry just to jump in to give Mary a little bit of a follow up which I think falls in the same game. Um, Lady Politic would be seems to represent something of a unique entity in this play um, in that you have these two completely good, morally perfect characters um, in Celia and Benario. And then you have a whole bunch of people who are avarici avaricious and nasty and clearly objectively bad people. Mm -hmm. And then you have you who mm -hmm. I, I, I guess I ended up finding myself curious, were you coming to hang with Volpone because you wanted his money or did you just really like Volpone? I think she's visiting, you know, she's yeah. English and she's visiting um, <laughs> Venice. And, you know, he's the cat, I guess. You know, I really didn't think that much about it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> sure. You know, I was just playing what the scene was. Um <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think Volpone you know, is a kind of tourist attraction. Here exactly. I am. Let's and go to Volpone's house. 
So if she thinks she can be in the will, why not? You know, if anybody, anybody thinks they can be in the will, why not? You know, uh, she definitely sure. wants to be in the will. She's so upset about it at the end. Right. Um, they are. They all are. Right. They all think they're going to be in the will. Yeah. So. But she and her husband, who I cut, Sir Politic is, and Peregrine are the characters who I cut. And they're sort of dilettantes, I think, uh, you know, if that's the right word. What what were the what what was the husband like? Maybe Jean can tell more, but can you tell? I mean, he's he's a. Go ahead, Jean. She, they're, they're two English people. Peregrine is a young Englishman who comes to Venice, and Sir Politic would be takes Peregrine under his wing and is going to show him Venice. But of course, the husband is a nutcase. He has all these inventions that he's doing. Like he thinks he can ward off the plague by hanging onions around a ship, for example. Diluted, he, yeah. He's just yeah. a, you know, a nutcase. He knows it also is one of these, Jonathan's making fun of him. He writes a diary where he accounts for every minute of the day. <laughs> so, you know, it's no wonder uh, Lady Woodby is tramping around Venice looking for something to do because she's, she's, you know, united with him. And Peregrine um, is much smarter. And he tricks this husband at one point into hiding under a giant tortoise shell and other characters ride on his back. And that's one of the great sight jokes of this play uh, in its full version is uh, the husband in a giant tortoise shell with his hand sticking out. And does Sir Politic, he has little bits of paper all around, all over him or something? Yeah, with all yeah. his notes. Yeah, yeah, I remember this. This is not a small part of the play, for those of you who don't know it. This is an entire act of the five act play. That See, I didn't know this I was, at all. Know. No, at one, I mean, I cut him from in 2012 too. I mean, at one point I said, well, this is going to be a four hour play or it's going to be a two hour comedy. <laughs> and we went for two hour comedy. It's right. almost like it's almost like a comedy doesn't need a comedic subplot. Um, can so yeah. can I ask um, the we've got some questions coming in which I would love to uh, to direct and one of them is specifically stated towards Jesse, but I'd love to actually give Mary a uh, chance to answer it first because she's got an, uh, has the actor perspective on this, which is um, we, we might as well ch get it out of the way. Uh, talk about the rehearsal process um, for the Zoom production and uh, the time spent. Uh, with actors on things like props and right. tech and how that was um, a little peek behind the curtain of uh, what that process was like. Mary, do you want to give it from the actor perspective? Uh, it's just, it's slightly challenging. I didn't really have horrible prop stuff um, in my character, but you know, the passing of stuff is technical and um, it, it, it's slightly challenging. It's slightly tedious to try to figure out exactly because Zoom is such a, you know, a different thing, but it really works and it really looked great. So you had to spend the time. I enjoyed the rehearsal process. I complained a lot about the technical aspects of everything, the green screen and, you know, and getting all that stuff. But um, I, I really enjoyed the rehearsal process, but it's such a wonderful group of people. How could you not, you know? I think, I think that's all I have to say. Props. The, um, the chastity belt was my, my favorite prop. <laughs> that was priceless. I'm glad you appreciated that, Jean. I mean, the actors really, they did a lot. And Mary did a lot. And, and Hamish, who was sweating, as you noticed, Jean, uh, rightfully so, because he had the most props and changes of anybody to deal with, plus a song that he was playing on his iPhone and, you know, all sorts of stuff. So it, it's hard. And, and I think uh, we were so grateful to the actors all throughout the shutdown for every everybody's work on these things, but particularly on something like Volpone, where we did we really did a lot of extra things with costumes and props. Um, it really takes a lot. And the actors, you know, actors are, are wonderful, talented people and it's really fun to work out timing when you're together in a room and you have a stage manager who can help you, you know, put the prop in the right place and you have a dresser who can help you get your corset on and they had to do all of this without any help. And so, you know, it's really kudos to everyone involved. That it, that it came yeah, out. so hopefully you guys don't get that used to that because, you know, <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, by the way, everybody's going to dress themselves now in the theater, yeah. you know. Find your own prop. You did it when you were at home. <laughs> Where did you get all the feather props for all the vultures and things? The actors didn't have to make those, did they? Oh, no. They didn't make any. No, no. We delivered all those things. We had a wonderful costume design team, Rodrigo Munoz and Sofia Prado, working from Clint Ramos' original designs for our 2012 production, um, found those 
we ordered our team, Nathan and Sherry, we ordered them, delivered them to the actors wherever they were, some in St. Louis, some in Los Angeles, most in New York. And and those Great. those costumes, we just received a costume piece late um, earlier today, uh, sort of a, a modern take on a coxcomb that um, was delivered from Russia after we bought it on Etsy. So it was oh, all all over all over the place. It was quite an experience. Um, our our uh, our offices became like a mailing sorting house for a bit in there. It was it was a joy. Um, the, and that question, uh, I should have said, that question came from Jennifer Parr. Um, we've, the first question that was asked is actually about a very specific thing, which I, it's probably a director question, I guess. Uh, Volpone's performance as the mountebank um, seduces Celia to throw her handkerchief. The effect on her husband is clear, but does Volpone feel that he has already won Celia and so has a right to her and will succeed in that that next gambit? Is that why they make the mistake they make? I think that's a great question, and I, I would agree. I think he thinks she's dropped her handkerchief because she understood the message he was sending. So yeah, I do, I, I do I, think he, he's a Lothario, and he, he sees himself as a great lover, and no reason why she shouldn't love him. And why does she drop it, then? Well, we have to assume she doesn't tell us, and Jean may have ideas. I, I think she's just playing. She's, she's locked up. She's only allowed to go to church sometimes. Her husband's away for five minutes. She opened the window and here's this charming character on the street. And he says, you know, he says, throw down your handkerchiefs. And so she does. She's flirting a little bit, playing a little bit. She doesn't expect to ever see him again. I think the uh, handkerchief is always an erotic object on the Renaissance stage. And so a woman throwing her handkerchief, Balponi isn't wrong to interpret it as a, an erotic signal. Whether she really meant it as such or was indeed just playing and assumed she would never get down from her second story perch to actually do anything with him is an open question. Um, and, you know, he doesn't look all that unattractive when he is dressed up as Goto. You know, he isn't really sick. And, you know, he, who knows? I mean, Corvino is not such a catch. <laughs> don't tell christine <laughs> we have a there's a couple of comments from uh gwyn dujardin uh that i are they're 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 basically just comments but they're both interesting comments so i'm just going to put them into the space in case uh uh we want to respond to them um one is that the ending the when we were talking about the ending of volpone and how it's sort of a tragic comedy morality play type thing um, she mentions that Shakespeare's Love's Labor's Lost has a similar style of ending where the princess assigns the failed suitors to tasks that correct their personal foibles. Baroon sent to talk to the sick because he needs to learn the meaning of language the same way that Volpone is sentenced to minister to the truly sick. Um, it, it's also a moralistic problem ending that way. Um, I don't know. Love's Labor, they're in relatively similar times, right? Love's Labor's Lost is a relatively late Comedy? Am no, I remembering that right? 1594. So it's nope. Early. Um, <laughs> Close. The, the difference is that the, I agree there are similarities. One of the differences is that they only have to do that for a year and then they're going to get the women. And so it's oh. like they're going to be punished, okay, but there's an end to the punishment. It's not like being in the galleys for the rest of your life or the hospital of being curable. But there is in that play a sense that the male ego has to be curbed and the women and it's a beautiful play for female power the women instructs the men on a lot of things and this ending is the end of their education but when they've been educated they're also going to be married so it shakespeare always has that feel in his comedies that it's going to turn out all right um, thank you. And then uh, th here's another one, which I don't, I think we're not going to be able to give her quite the answer she wants, but maybe we can talk about it now. This is also from Gwen. Uh, she's wondering what, if any, discussions there were during rehearsal about performing a play about a character faking sick during a pandemic where illness skepticism, the belief that people were faking or exaggerating the disease, was a real problem for public health. Um, uh, and she... Uh, 
she says that she prefers the moralistic ending because it punishes him for feigning sickness and dispatches him to help the chronically ill. Um, I just found that an interesting thought. I'm not sure that there's anything to say to it, but... Well, I can answer the question. That's a very interesting thought. We didn't talk about it at all. <laughs> we were too busy handing off props. <laughs> I did think about the plague part. Um, the fact that the excise subplot that you didn't really, you know, fully stage, which was fine with me, does make mention of plague. And of course, that was always a worry in a port city, and they got the source of it wrong. It was rats, not, um, it couldn't be scared off with onions. But mm -hmm. there is a kind of penumbra of disease around this plague. Um, fake disease, real disease, that's there. Um, that, mm, that one could in another production decide to bring out. I mean, there's another, there's another play to be brought out than the one that was performed, mm -hmm. um, I think. There always is another play. Yeah, my, yeah. Uh, that's really interesting. Uh, just one, I'd forgotten about that, about the plague and the peregrine and, uh, and the serpolitic plot, because I didn't revisit that as we, re as we were in the text this time. Um, but that's really interesting. And just one thing uh, that relates to the alchemist, um, those of you who are following the whole story, um, one of the first lines of the alchemist is, of course, about the end of the plague, because that entire plot hinges on the master being out of town because there's a plague. So we're really looking forward to coming back at the end of our plague for the comedy. <laughs> so if, if you had put the husband back in, you could have switched onions to uh, injecting daylight into themselves to protect themselves from the plague. Um, equally absurd. Anyway, uh, the great uh, uh, Marianne has a question. Um, the comedy in Afra Ben plays that are set in Naples, the Rover Part One and the Emperor of the Moon, seem to have been influenced by Johnson, especially concerning delusion. Any thoughts? One of those wonderful comments with a question put tagged. Thank you, Marianne. Um, was is it possible that Afra Ben or probable that Afra Ben was um, inspired by Johnson? Yes, the answer is yes, and a lot of other people. Ben was well read, and she knew all these um, plays by both Johnson and Shakespeare. And the difference often is in the rover is the enormous space given to the female uh, heroine and her ability to rove, to manipulate, and to control plots. More than women are given that power in Johnson, usually. Well, I'd say that's a, quite a, that's a difference. But Ben was a real good reader of early 17th century drama. Jean, can you think of a play where Ben Johnson gave women their due that I'm not aware of? Because, well, may, I mean, even Doll Common in The Alchemist is a wonderful character, but she doesn't get what Subtle and Face get. And it's one reason why I wanted to have women play some of these roles that they, you know, otherwise wouldn't get to play, like Morbino and Capaccio and Abacadore, um, because we have so many wonderful actresses. No, there, I, there isn't one. I mean, there are great female characters in Bartholomew Fair, like Ursula the Pig Woman. But she is really interesting because she's this great, grotesque woman who has a place where you eat pig, and then she has bottles that other women urinate in. So her pig house is both a urinal and a diner. And you know, Let's do you, it. Don't, you don't ever forget <laughs> Ursula the Pig Woman, but you know, you don't, you know, <laughs> it's, she's, she's a, a wonderful female character, notorious one, but yeah. she's not like an, a heroine in the traditional sense. Well, it sounds like the title character of a new play. Yeah. Uh, obviously not as large, but given that we just did a reading of it, uh, Agrippina in um, Sejanus is a pretty powerful three-dimensional uh, female character, but obviously that was not his most successful play. So I'm not sure how that counts, but that, that's, that's one that one could think of, perhaps. And there's Livia in that same play. Yeah. Yeah, a little more yucky, but yes. Right, <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, we're we're uh, keep bringing the questions, y'all, because we're out. I think we have another comment. Um, but oh, this is about Lady Politic. Volpone is an old guy who was a beautiful young guy. Lady Politic is working both sides. She wants love and flattery as well. 
Coming sure. in the yeah. Of course. What woman doesn't want that? You know, <laughs> doesn't matter what the age. Right. I want to go back to the question of do any of the characters in this play, are they all self-deluded? And I would make the case that Mosca is the one possible exception yeah. that he begins to understand his power. He begins to understand how he might change his role. He begins to be aware that he could change his life. Yeah. Now, he miscalculates and in the end he overdoes it. But Mosca has got some self-awareness, I think. And he's to me always the most interesting character in this play for me. And it's partly because he has that modicum of self-awareness that makes him kind of interesting and able to grow yes. a little bit. But he's also human, so he gets carried away. He he gets he gets on the same train. It's like, oh, I could be rich, you know, yeah. and powerful. So but I agree with you on that. That's right. Yeah. Well he has that great line of where in that same speech, I think you're referring to Gene, where he has that realization, oh my God, I'm so great. I could do anything. I could, I could get out of my role as the parasite, as the, and he says almost all the world, what does he say? Almost all the world is parasites or sub parasites, which seems to be Johnson's point of view. <laughs> you know, if you want to take the dark view, everybody is an animal. Um, we are human animals. We're vultures, we're crows, we're flies, we're foxes, whatever your, whatever your beast is. But I'm the best parasite of all. And of course, he, as you said, he miscalculates, but I think he's, he's wrong. He can't escape his role, especially in a play that where everybody is defined by their animal archetype. Um, he's the parasite, he needs the host. So in his attempt to get out of his role, um, it's doomed because he can't survive without the host. May I? That's an interesting perspective, Jesse. Yeah, so he can't really become the magnifico he wants to become. Yeah. Just as a, a perhaps a counter. So I find the relationship between these two to be by far the most interesting part of the play. Um, and I, I am curious when actually it first occurs to Mosca that why can't he be heir at some point as the great trickster? Um, and I'm curious whether or not that exists from the when that tension enters the play. Um, between the two of them. I mean, he has that very odd little line, odd little comment um, when he's left the mountebank scene where he's like, oh yeah, you were great. Actually, I don't have time to flatter you. I have to go do a thing. Right. Which is like this weirdly self-aware moment of like, maybe he's not actually being all that honest with Volpone either. And I found it really interesting that the the commoner, the only commoner in the play, is not self is being forced to use his talent and skill to make the rich richer right um which has one set of moralities which is an interesting one and then the additional set of moralities is when said commoner suddenly gets riches he immediately turns into an avaricious avaricious <laughs> rich dude like yeah. it's a very pessimistic look at wealth mm -hmm. um and and I'm not sure it's a wrong one uh, but it, it did it did strike me that he was really, really smart and really, really capable until he got rich. And then he immediately lost it. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I'm sure everyone, I want to say two things. One is um, there's a really interesting adaptation of Volpone by Stefan Zweig, which I'm sure Gene, you probably are aware of. And it held the stage. It was the, it was a German version that was translated in, into English. And it was the more commonly performed version of Volpone, if I'm remembering this right, Gene, correct me if I'm wrong. It was the more commonly performed version of Volpone, I think, for 40 or 50 years in the 20th century. And, it, and at the end of this Volpone, Mosca gives his money away to the poor. He does win, and he gives the money away to the poor. And so, you know, like that, it's, it takes what you were saying, Nathan, and takes it in a different direction, in the kind of proletariat socialist direction. Um, but I, I think that, I think that the, the idea that he could become the heir is probably latent, but, it, but in the play, in terms of the acting of it and the forming of it, I mean, I would look for the moment in the play where he, where he really realizes it beginning with that speech in scene eight, but not, not fully until the actual scene where Volpone says, here's my will. Yeah. Ding. It's just more active for an audience to just experience that moment of discovery together. But I do think that Volpone and Mosca have a very super duper codependent relationship. And I would, I did say to Hamish that uh, early on, he emailed me a few days before we started rehearsal and said, you know, give me some thoughts about the character. And one of the things I said was, I think that they really love each other and they really need each other and they're totally symbiotic, but every sort of 
12th hour or on, on the seventh day, Mosca wants to kill the opponent. He would like to kill him. <laughs> he does everything for him. And he gets, you know, he gets to enjoy the party in the house, but he's never thanked enough. He never gets to be the heir. And so I think... And it does... <laughs> But please tell me, because I, I really only know your version. I've read the other one, but it's been a little bit, and I've, I've now read yours a whole bunch. Um, but the uh, he's so, he revels in joining these other people in making fun of Volpone. That doesn't, to me, feel fake. No, like, I so I, I, yeah, I love that, that he's he's releasing all of this energy, but it's, it's, in an alliance, but he also gets to call him an old fart, and it's just yeah. an interesting love-hate relationship to me. Great license he has, and it reminds me of uh, the Commedia and Harlequin, and um, and I think Johnson was working on some of those, uh, working on some of those ideas. Isn't the help always smarter, though? The help is always smarter. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that is. Do you think, Mary, that um, Nano and the uh, Castrati and the Androgyne, you know, they were an interesting trio in this production. Do you think that they were presented? How did you think they were? They the help? Oh yeah, and were yeah, they they're part? like yeah, they're totally the help. Yeah, they're in, they're the downstairs. Uh -huh. They are the downstairs. Yeah, yeah. And so you know, and so they're more facile. They're more protean, and you know, uh, they just can they just can do more and get away with more because they kind of come in and come out too. You know, it's not like they're there all the time. They're just there, you know, my Lord, what can I do for you? You know, kind of thing. And they're so, uh, yeah. yeah. And then they're talent, you know, what they're super talented. He's got a house, he's got a house circus really, but it's, yeah. it's a house band, it's a house, you know. Totally. What, how, what was the music incorporation like? I just did it. I didn't, you know, yeah. did, is say, well, yeah, I didn't ask you a lot of questions, but the songs that you put in there, well, how did you guys decide which songs to put in? Well, the song, it's interesting. There, are, the play itself has, Nathan and I were talking about this earlier um, before we got online. The songs all existed in the play with the exception of where we asked you to sing a little uh, Verity, you know, he talks about music, but there's no line for Lady Politics to sing in Johnson's original. But Nano Castroni and Androgyno are specifically called upon to sing at each of the three instances where we had them in the first scene with Volpone, he says, you know, sing something for me. And um, then as the Scotto Mantuana scene where they're selling the oils, they are the sales people and Mosca is called upon. No, but those weren't the original songs. None of those were the original songs. Yeah. And and some and then there's the other one that's later where he, he's bored and he wants a song. Um, all of those texts exist, plus the one that he sings Cecilia. All of those songs. So that the song that he sang, Cecilia, is we kept the original Johnson text because that is just wonderful text. The other texts were are you know just a little less funny now and a little more or less tasteful, especially mm -hmm. regarding um, making fun of androgyna and and right. or making fun of little people or making fun right. of right. So I that was my first impulse with Jeff. It's like I just need something better that's just as funny that allows these people. Yes. To Enjoy being yeah, and it's fun. good when you snap into like the modern, you know. And that was all, yeah. You know, that yeah. was all, and no, bring, it's good. just bringing just playfulness to it that that matched who they were, but obviously brought us some twentieth, twenty first century joke. And they would be the Greek chorus in the Alan Menken musical version of Volpone. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that's why I said they're protean. They remind me of the yeah. three people in you know, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Totally, they, they're the proteans. They're three of them, yep. and that's their their role is to serve all those kind of things. You know, that's right. yeah, the same stuff. And yeah. to do wop in the back of the other songs. Yeah, yeah. This, I don't know how <laughs> yeah. well this came through on the Zoom, but this this was just a great idea to have them be the backup band for that sales pitch as well as the crowd, you know, yeah. you know which is Love Monty Python-esque, but yes, super fun. Totally. You know. Are there any women here? Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember that? One of my favorite Life of Brian. I, I mean. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're, we're just because I'm, we, we now have a bunch of questions and I'm, I'm a little bit aware of the time. There are people who are, I, I, I do think it's probably worth at least commenting because now two people have asked a little bit more about the process on Zoom of, of rehearsing, of what that is like for you as a director and you as an actor and whether there are any advantages, disadvantages, etc. And then someone else is asking a little bit about how exactly we handled, uh, they're asking basically about OBS. 
uh, which I think we can at least address briefly. But Jesse, do you want uh, Jesse and Mary? Do you want to talk a little bit about just the challenges or advantages? Maybe advantages is more interesting. Is there anything that you found helpful or or um, enlightening um, about the Zoom world? I like the Zoom world. I have no problem with the Zoom world. And I think I like it because when you're looking at the screen, you see everyone. And, uh, you know, of course, you did some technical stuff where only the audience saw the people that were doing the play. But when you're doing a Zoom reading, you're able to sort of look into somebody's eyes without it. I find it really interesting. So to be able to watch everybody, um, I thought was uh, fascinating and I, I enjoy a zoom thing. Now I enjoy more being in person in the theater, but I also enjoy this, this, um, this technology. So, um, so I, I had a wonderful time, you know, doing it. That's great to hear Mary. So here's the, the zoom of the year question. When we're all back in person soon, are you still going to come along for a zoom reading just for fun? Yeah, I don't have any problem with it. You're in your house. Like I can be in my pajamas, except for, you know, if you've got a costume, but you're in your house. It's like less stress, you know, I, and I actually like it. Mary, could, could you also speak? Sorry, I, I, I have found it very interesting um, finding the balance between stage work and film work that Zoom represents because it's so first person compared to television, right? It's really not television. And if you don't explode your box, it gets boring very quickly. So have you, um, how have you found adjusting your acting to this weird little box? Well, I haven't done anything that's, no, that's not true. I did um, <laughs> rabbit hole on a Zoom reading. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it just depends on what you're doing. You know, if you're doing a farce, then you, you're doing a farce. If you're doing something really realistic, then you're doing, I don't change anything for the Zoom. You know, it's the same as if I were doing a stage thing or a film thing, I would do the same sort of amount of gas. Let's put it that way. Hmm. Um, so I don't, I don't think I change anything. Um, no. Got it. Yeah, that's interesting. You were, you were great. You filled up yeah. the Zoom world just oh. fast. Oh, that's well. very nice of you to say. I had a little, you know, because I'm going to tell the story, Jesse, because, okay. you know, I did government inspector and I played Anna in a certain kind of way. And I knew this character was the same in many ways. It was kind of the same. And for me as an actor, and I had discussions with Jesse, I didn't want to do the same thing. So I kept trying to find like a really annoying voice to do this character. And it just, it wasn't right. And I knew I had to go back. But for me, I was trying to find something different as an actor that, you know, somebody would see this and go, oh, she's playing that character again, you know. Uh, it was purely, you know, ego driven, but, um, I also really loved that because I made a complete asshole out of myself. And, and that's how you learn as an actor. So I was very happy to go through the process and then return to what I knew was going to work. <laughs> that was fun. And that, that, that our, your journey with that and some of the other actors' journeys were, it just made it like a rehearsal process. Yes, exactly. It was. We only had four, really four and a half days of rehearsal, for, you know, like 25 hours all told yeah. together. So it wasn't a lot. But we had such a great group of actors and I think people's comfort level with the Zoom and everything else over the last year has gotten so much better that all of us are just better at communicating on it. And so mm -hmm. we were able to just relax and, and play with the play and ask those kinds exactly. of questions. Exactly, yeah. Rehearsals with the time we had. So you know, I, I definitely don't prefer it to live theater. And while watching it live on Monday night was exciting, and I really, I thought it went great. It was fun. And I was alone here in this office going, and I would go, ah, you got it. It, it worked. <laughs> um, it's not the same as being in person, but there are lots no. of- No, of it. course not. It's not at all, but do, you know, it's doable. Do you yeah. miss laughter, Mary? Um, uh, I suppose I do. I have to say, you know, pandemic wise, uh, I enjoyed the pause. Um, so, I think when I get back to a live audience and I hear the laughter again, I'll be delighted. But um, I, it wasn't like I was down. I risk. I have a friend who's who is, 
you know, I've got to do this thing and I don't have an audience and I need an audience. I need laughs, you know, and it's like, well, try and see what it's like to do it without and, and just do it without, you know? So when I get back to a live thing and hopefully people will laugh if I'm doing something funny, I'm sure I'll love it, but I'm okay with it without it as well. Jesse, are you thinking of doing anything still on zoom when this, this horrible period is over? I mean, you're going to do live shows, but are you thinking of any zoom something? Yes, we really are. We haven't figured out exactly what we're going to do, but we've to be one of the silver linings for us and, and everything we're doing is that we've reached a wide, a much wider audience. And it's no, it's not the same as live theater, but folks all across the world are able to tune in and watch these readings. And, and the discussions that we're having, like the one we're having now. So we feel we've met a lot of people who wanted to, some people who would write me and say, I live in Seattle. I've always wanted to see your work. I finally got to you know, experience it. I know it's not the same as live theater, but thank you. So, uh, so yes, we're gonna continue to offer some online programming and we're very excited to get back to the- Next year I'll be starring as the pig woman. In that, <laughs> in that <laughs> yes. Um, it's a great part, Mary. It's a really good one. Uh, uh, it sounds a lot like well, I'm we'll on see. We'll see. <laughs> so I think we've hit the point where we're gonna do a whip round of the these final questions because a lot of them are kind of quick quick questions. Um, but and we're getting close to our time, so just to get a few of them because we've got quite a few. Well, there are better questions than the mayor's lightning round debate last night. <laughs> uh, I had already <laughs> voted, so I didn't watch. Um, so the uh, so starting with Elsa Efren, uh, Jesse, uh, she's asking whether or not there were auditions or whether we had people in mind from the start. Just pulling no that curtain back. No auditions. We just asked people that we knew and loved and hope they said yes. Um. Uh, Regina Jane wonders whether or not we think Mosca would get himself out of the galleys. Oh, I hope so, but I doubt it. Um, oh, I think he would. Oh, good. <laughs> um, the Sherry Friedman is asking about the the um, the placement of the boxes and how we did that to give a very short answer to a very long question. Um, there is a program called Online Broadcasting System where you can basically live cut out pieces of your computer and put them into that and it will broadcast that. So basically we have Zoom as like a paint template and then we put them into a pre-designed set of, of boxes that Jesse sketches out and our operator that or the director sketches out and our operator then builds. And so that does allow us to know that person X will be to the left of person Y, which then means that we can plan the prop handoffs to work correctly uh, because we know exactly where the boxes are going to be. We're not fighting constant change on Zoom. Yeah, um, and we should give kudos to, we've really developed a great team that, of, ex, of experts in this program over the last nine months. And Jessica Fournier has done a terrific job uh, and putting in all those cool fades and, you know, Star Wars fades and things like that. But, uh, you know, and and we experimented even more. This is the first time I think we used circles and things, different shapes. John Arnone was the set designer for our production of 2012, and he provided some beautiful backgrounds and, and uh, other things for the, you know, for the online production. So uh, that design team and technical team are were really top notch. Um. Uh, great. Yep. And sh they, I agree. Uh, they were, um, and then, uh, uh, Leslie, uh, Jost, Jost asks, apologies, um, asks, uh, how was the play received when it was originally performed? Hit or flop? Um, hit. Johnson was a hit most of the time um. until he wasn't in the late twenties, but that's a long way down the road from this play. Yeah. For a guy who doesn't like wealth, he really did go after the biggest jobs. Um, but there we are. Uh, Died in the poorhouse, though, right? He sure did. Oh, God, not another one. Sorry, it's hard to end on a summer. <laughs> um, Moscow, at least he didn't die in a ditch outside a bar like Shakespeare. So, you know, pick your poison. Um, so, uh, <laughs> or get sick in a ditch outside a bar. Anyway, uh, Moscow, uh, uh, is a typical servant cum creator, manipulator of the deceit in Spanish Golden Age plays. How typical or atypical is Mosca of servants in Johnson's plays? A lot like face. Yeah, I was just going to say face. All the face is so clever in The Alchemist. He's just like Mosca. 
only in the end his master remasters him but he has a long run of independence before he's remastered so pretty typical there are a lot of clever servants in johnson yeah um uh, nancy matthew simply says yay i'm excited to hear you're going to do more online programming so that's good oh, to know yeah. and hey, then hey, i am going to a quick question sorry nathan can i ask a quick question if you can answer i i'm just curious when we think about the plays of venice and uh I think, and the beginning of this play, I'm thinking about the Jew of Malta and I'm thinking about the Merchant of Venice and I'm thinking about Volpone. Do you have something pithy that that conjures up for you? Are there any connections? Where, where are they anywhere near when he wrote Volpone, Merchant of Venice and Jew of Malta? Jew was obviously earlier. Yeah, the Jew of Malta doesn't take place in Venice. No, it says Malta, but it starts with the, it starts with the gold, right? Well, and that's that's, that's Marlowe. Yeah. That's early okay. 1590s, but the um, Merchant of Venice is like 1598. So it's a good eight or nine years earlier. Othello is much closer, the more of Venice, and that's 1604 or so. So it's right before this, but Venice just had this cachet. Yeah, and there were lots of plays that dealt with either its mercantile wealth or its corruption or its sexy, its sexy exotic erotic great city to set a play in um great well and and uh marianne i'm just i've seen your comment in the comment section um i don't know what you're referring to and i am curious so if you could please email me about whatever it is you are referring to at nathan at redbulltheater.com that's probably a conversation for a different situation um but she's asking about a specific thing that would allow both um, hyperflex. hyperflex hyperflex so i'm 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 curious about it currently not in the plans but hey uh we'll see um Brave new world Yes. Well, uh, great. That is all the time we have. We whip around all through the questions. Thank right. you um, to uh, thank you to all to uh, blah, 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 blah. Jean, Jesse, Mary Testa. I'm doing great. It's eight thirty. It's time for a drink. Um, the uh, the and we. <laughs> no worries. Uh, you have until tomorrow. At 7 p.m. to watch Volpone one more time or to tell your friends to watch it. Uh, definitely worthwhile if you haven't seen it so far or if your friends haven't. So please do do it. It's easy to find on both the Red Bull webpage and on the Red Bull YouTube page. We have only one more event this sort of season before we go to sleep a little bit. Not really. We just plan for our next season over the summer. Um, and that is our short new play festival where we will uh, present eight 10-minute plays, two of them commissioned works by... Jose Rivera and C.A. Johnson and six that are winners of a competition that we held uh, that had many, 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 many um, applicants and we really ended up with six great plays. So please do check in for that. That will be live on July 12th at 7.30. So mark your calendars. And that is all she wrote for tonight. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and I look forward to seeing you at the next Red Bull event. Who knows? Maybe we'll see all of each other in person one of these days. Relatively soon. We will. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.